Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Decision Point Trading Room. My name is Erin Swenlin, and I'm here with my father, Carl Swenlin. And we're going to show you the charts that we feel you need to see going into this week. We'll show you what our indicators have been telling us, and we will also do a sector and industry group deep dive and look at a few symbols and your requests. So without further ado, I think we should just get started. I want to start out uh, mentioning John Malden's latest free uh, newsletter from the weekend. And he goes into the, the failure of the 60-40 portfolio, uh, which is something that has been followed by everybody for decades, supposed to have 60% stocks and 40% bonds in your portfolio. When stocks are going down, bonds are supposed to go up. And that's worked fine until now we all know, if you've been following this broadcast, that bonds are going down in the long term and probably will, you know, for another several decades. Uh, that's what I assume when we uh, when we see a shift, a long term shift, that it'll start going the other way. But uh, this is causing all types of problems for portfolio managers and pension mm -hmm. funds in particular. Um, State of California brags about their budget surplus, but they actually owe about a trillion dollars to the pension funds. So uh, we're, we're going to see pension funds hitting the news uh, more and more. Uh, I, just going over the, uh, I've got a list of bubbles or bubble-like uh, things that we should be watching. Housing bubble, we know that's starting to, to deflate. Equities bubble, we're in the middle of that deflating. The bonds have just started uh, within the last year, I think, about. Uh, and now we have can add pension funds to the list that they're they're really running into trouble with this this uh, shift in the way bonds are behaving. And uh, of course, the cryptos. I heard a, on the uh, radio they have a a finance show on Sundays, and I was I was fixing a pot roast and listening to that and. Uh, they're talking about there was an ad for cryptos, and there was a, a, a caution that cryptos can go, you can lose money all the way down to everything you can lose with cryptos. And I thought to myself, no one's ever said that about gold, <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, they have not. Because <laughs> no matter what, it's not paper, it's a, it's gold. Um, and then another thing that comes up is, you know. I've committed to, uh, to treasuries myself uh, since they're starting to pay a nice interest rate. Uh, and I got to thinking about the uh, governments worldwide are just in terrible uh, de deficit situations and they, that they have huge debts piled up. And we, you know, the U.S., of course, has been piling up debt like crazy in the last, oh, four, <laughs> forever, but really, really bad in the last uh, several years. So that's another thing that, you know, you're in treasuries and you got to wonder, okay, when will the tipping point come if it's going to come on uh, currencies collapsing because it's too much debt? Just one of those nice things to think about on a Monday. <laughs> okay, so let me get into. Um, I, I guess I got to share, don't I? That's the first thing I need to do. That would work out well. Yeah. Okay, and here we are. Um. We are actually rallying today. Um, not the greatest rally that we've seen, but we've 
we've broken out of this, uh, uh, broken above this declining tops line. And uh, uh, let me get my pointers growing up here. Um, last week, I'm sorry, the week before last, this was a major day here. When this broke down in the morning, it was just, it was coming unraveled unbelievably. And I thought it sound, it felt to me like we were really going to get a crash. And uh, at some point, some entity, maybe the Fed, maybe not, but some entity moved in and started buying. And it just gradually moved higher and higher and it, a huge turnaround. And since then, we've been trending upward in the since this low. And this will probably be the low for the next month or so at, um, around that. Uh, I, I've been expecting a rally uh, since um, the weekend after this big turnaround that I started thinking about it. We've got sentiment uh, is is really in, in favor of the bulls. Um, we've got uh, seasonality. We're headed. We're in within a week or so of changing to a six month period of favorable seasonality, and uh, this does look like the October low. We've got. We'll look at the indicators and, and show you there, but we've got. Um, positive divergences all over the place and just uh, it looks very much like we're going to get a bear market rally because of all those things I talked about at the beginning I do not think that this is going to be the end of the bear market uh, we, Aaron agrees with me so far that yes, we're going so to <laughs> that we're going to be uh We'll have a bear market rally here. It could be exciting, right? But it's really struggling so far. Uh, but at least we broke out of this de uh, descending wedge formation and uh, struggled some, but it was just a breakout and a pullback to the support, and um, and it's moving higher. So it's just really a uh, textbook and just very uh, positive looking. Let's see. We often talk too on a, about the fact that you know if it, if it doesn't go down and test completely that support line, that that's a really good sign. So we didn't come down and test that September low. So um, I, it seems to me that that is going to be a, a positive here. That on Friday we just never did go all the way down to test that three fifty five three sixty area. Right. Yeah, it's just that was a pullback. Started on Friday, you know, continued on Friday, and then uh, rallied from there. Mm -hmm. I was looking at the new high, new low chart this morning, and uh, this is for New York Stock Exchange. And uh, notice we have a. Um, positive divergence on on this low uh, on that turnaround day and uh, that's very positive oh, I mean we love this this indicator it's 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 just really gives us positive divergences uh, time after time it's just so reliable if I look at the s p 500 version of this, and uh, you can see all along here that there are plenty of examples where we get, at critical times, we get uh, uh, positive divergences that are really uh, should pay attention to. Um, I guess I, I didn't look at that. We didn't get one on the new lows here. We got um, lower lows, um, new lows, but on the... Uh, High low differential, we did get a positive divergence on that. Oh, yes, I didn't even notice that. Uh, 
um, Aaron did a pretty good job on the. Um, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> an excellent job uh, on a free article this uh, weekend and uh, on the Silver Cross and Golden Cross indicators. Here's here's what I was t been talking about here. We've got uh, on we've got these double this double bottom here, and we got positive divergence on the short term STOs, swindling trading oscillator, and then the IT, IT breadth momentum and volume momentum indicators. Uh, positive divergence is there. So th this is. Uh, this is really strong evidence. I'm, I'm really feeling uh, confident about uh, this uh, rally. Moving over to the four, we've got the dollar index. It's having some problems. Um, notice we had a parabolic advance short-term basis and it did pull back to a rising trend line. And uh, then we have a triangle formation. It's trying to break down out of that. Gold is uh, still looking somewhat positive. We've got a double bottom here. We have a breakout from the short term declining tops line. So as a holder of gold, I'm um, hoping this turns into a uh, stronger rally. Crude oil. Um, it's, it's basically started to move sideways, uh, broken above this declining tops line, and uh, notice that the, the 20, 50, and 200 uh, EMAs are just all lined up and crowded together, it'll be really easy for a little bit of price upside or downside to change uh, buy signals on these buy and sell signals. Treasuries, um, looking a little healthy today, uh, holding on the support. We started a waterfall decline here. And we mentioned it in the uh, DPA on the weekend, which is a sure way to bring in some support. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wanted to look at the uh, one-year chart on there. Okay, there's just very dramatic uh, weakness on the treasuries. The 10 year yield, we had a parabolic advance short term and it corrected back to the horizon trend line. And now we have another, not as sharp parabolic advance, uh, struggling minutely here, but uh, probably going to move higher. I have the, yeah. The, the yield away, this is uh, current as of Friday. This is an end of day update, but obviously yields are going through the roof. They had a pullback on Friday, but here the one year is at 4.58%. And it is the highest of, of all at this present time. I have been following some high uh, yield stocks, just a few here. Uh, a, a fellow on the uh, Barney show recommended Verizon uh, as a high yield stock, which he says the annual dividends is very solid. I, 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 uh, I will take his word for it. But when I looked at the chart, I thought, well, this is not looking so great at this time. Uh, that yield could be getting could be getting higher. 
And so if you go and look at the weekly chart of Verizon, whoa. <laughs> oh my you know, goodness. Right. And uh, so far, he's right that dividend is holding. And But then let's go to the monthly, and it's even a, a worse picture. So I, I think that if we look at, at uh, this, if going from this high down to around this area, that's about a 60% decline. And I think it's, it's headed that way. I don't, I can't guarantee that's where it's going, but, and there's some good support in this, uh, see this congestion could find some support there, but in a bear market, and it's looking at that as a waterfall decline on a monthly chart. And that looks pretty bad. And another one that I've been following, and I don't recall if I've mentioned this one before, and I, this is not a recommendation, uh, just uh, a curiosity. Uh, the Global X Super Dividend ETF uh, is paying almost 16% dividend. Mm. And it pays that out on a monthly basis. It is going down, though. Yes, it is. And again, uh, I I don't know how most people do it, but I'm a great user of the weekly and monthly charts. Um, and here we see uh, the low for this uh, ETF was uh, uh, back here at the 2020 bear market. And uh, so I'd say there's a good chance before this bear market is over that it'll hit that for sure. And uh, monthly is not much help. So that is the low to be looking at. And uh, but there's no guarantee that that would hold, of course. And is there anything else I should cover and let the, leave some more time for the um, oh, we, I think we're pretty good. Um, did we? I know you talked about Bitcoin, but did we actually look at the chart? I did. I skipped over that. There you go. Mm -hmm. uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is uh, it's right around. Uh, here's eighteen thousand is the longer term support, and uh, um, this is I think nineteen thousand seems to be more persistent uh, a level of support. But right now, it's still moving in this basing pattern. And that's... Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, one of the things I've talked about in the DP alert is the fact that we probably will see a quote-unquote breakout from that declining trend, but we shouldn't get too excited. It looks like it's just going to kind of drift out of that declining trend, certainly not anything that would be, you know, if we get a nice spike that would break us out of that declining trend, I'd feel better about it. But typically when you get that drift out of a trend line, it's not really, you shouldn't read it very much into it. One of the comments we've got is that your volume is low. And I think there is some issue we've got to work out after the show. Uh, I'm, I'm yes. coming through louder than you are, and you are. You know, it's like you're further away from the mic. Yeah, it's anyhow, really strange. I I have not figured out why it, this mic has been this way forever. So that's better. Whatever you were doing there was much better. Oh, okay. Well, like that. Is that better? Yes, indeed. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, good to know. <laughs> Uh, you uh, in a Seinfeld, Seinfeld would call you a low talker. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm not a close talker, though. <laughs> no, you're not a close talker. Okay. All right. I will take the screen here and let's hope that everything uh, transfers over nicely. All right. You're seeing that, Dan? I am. All right. Let's get it going. Okay, so what we are looking at here is a candle glance of the S&P sectors. And I love to look at this first thing in the morning to give me a really good sense of what's actually going on. Where is the strength? 
when I looked at this, the first thing that caught my eye were the breakouts here on XLV above that 200 day EMA, the breakout above the 50 day EMA on XLI. Those two were particularly uh, eye catching, if you will. But looking closer, you can see a little bit of a breakout here on consumer staples from what looks like a reverse head and shoulders pattern. So that looks very uh, encouraging, as we often say. XLE continues to do well. You know, XLE is certainly tied to crude oil, but that doesn't seem to be keeping it down because as we looked at that USO chart, really what we're getting is a lot of that uh, sort of sideways, um, you know, drift out of, you know, that declining trend. It just really hasn't gotten going. But XLE obviously hasn't been perturbed as it's gotten that breakout. It came in last week and it's just continuing. So looking at the PMOs, I mean, all of them are now pretty much rising. The one in real estate still a little bit suspect. And utilities, we are seeing that little tick upward on the PMO. But again, the, the price action on those two sectors is still really um, uh, not good. Uh, pathetic, I don't know if pathetic is quite the right word there, but certainly not looking good for real estate and utilities. On um, you know, technology gets a lot of the um, you know press, if you will, and that's going to be the place where, of course, we would want to look toward if we're going to have a nice bear market rally. It's doing fine. We're in a nice rising trend, but let's go ahead and start looking under the surface at a few of these particular sectors. So these uh, we've had uh, lots of requests for these particular charts. They are only av available to our subscribers and they are updated uh, daily So by Carl. So you can see what he's thinking about on these charts, even though we don't talk to every one of them. And what we want to do on these is to look under the hood is what I often will say. We have the breakout here. That's great. RSI becoming positive here on XLK. Like I said, PMOs are looking good across the board. Notice the Silver Cross Index is starting to make a move to the upside. Haven't seen that in quite a quite a while. But the uh, participation under the surface is what we really want to pay attention here. And what we're seeing is a lot of stocks getting above their 20-day EMAs, which makes sense because that's what's happening for XLK itself. We still need to see that improvement of stocks moving above their 50-day EMAs. That might take a little while just because a lot of those stocks are configured similarly to XLK. And you can see XLK still has some work to do to get above the 50-day EMA. But this, seeing two-thirds of them above their 20-day EMA, I think is really encouraging when you look at technology in particular because it does tend to lead the market. So I'm liking what I'm seeing here under the surface for technology but really, when we're talking about price breakouts, before you go, yes, <laughs> uh, you notice the uh, technology. It's only up one percent today. I think it's probably the third highest advance uh, on a brief scan there. But there, are, you know, non-tech sectors that are way ahead of the tech sector this this morning. So it's showing uh, continued. Uh, weakness there. And you know, the thing about the stocks above their 20, uh, that is, uh, has reached a level uh, that in the, since the beginning of September has proven to be uh, overbought. That's very true. And if we see the breakout there from those highs, I think that would be especially encouraging for XLK. But yeah, there still seems to be some tentativeness on XLK. So let's see, I, I scooted back so that went wrong. There we go. So the breakouts, though, that really were impressive to me were in the industrials. I mean, you could see that big move above the 50-day EMA there. PMO is starting to accelerate higher out of oversold conditions. You can see the Silver Cross reading better than what we saw in XLK. 
certainly, as you can see back down here, we're hitting a little bit of a spike here in relative performance. The stochastics are above 80, which I love to see because typically when they run above 80, you're gonna see nice rallies. So that's why we wanna get stochastics above 80, which is where they are right now. Don't have quite as many above their 20, but we do have as XLK, but we do have more above their 50 day EMA. So you can see industrials have really kickstarted a bit more than technology has. The other one that we were looking at was Staples. That's got that nice breakout here, big gap, not a big gap, but a gap up. And there's that reverse head and shoulders. And then going under the surface, we can see that we still have some pretty good participation here. It has been angling up. Um, but as you were mentioning, you've got, you are, we're hitting some of these uh, overbought conditions that we saw back in September, but we know that it certainly can get much uh, higher than what we're at now. So we'll be wanting to pay attention to those rising trends of the stocks above their 20 and 50 day EMAs. Still taking a little bit of time to, for stocks to get above their 200, but honestly, dad, when I look at this, having a third of XLP, the staples above their 200 day EMAs, I think that looks pretty darn good. But we have to be careful because you can see that the relative strength for XLP, while it is moving higher, is not really as good as some of those other sectors. So, for example, I thought industrials relative strength looked a bit better. Yeah, and notice that it still hasn't fallen from the its all time high uh, to a bear market. It's only uh, gone down seventeen and a half percent. So, so it's technically not. So technically, it's there. still um, a viable uh, option. Yep. I do like this area for sure. All right. Let me get. Uh, I have a question here, if I oh, may interrupt. Yes. Uh, the uh, Alan says I read an article over the weekend claiming the Golden Cross is the single best indicator to use to determine the end of a bear market. What's your thoughts and opinion? Now, did you make such a claim in your article? <laughs> I did not make that claim in the, the article, so I'm really curious where he heard that, and it makes me feel great that uh, somebody mentioned it. So, Yeah, if uh, I'd like to see the article. Uh, uh, we've been trying to get the word out on the Golden Cross and Silver Cross and uh, it would be nice to know that somebody else has picked up on it. Yeah, they're paying attention mm -hmm. because we also do think it's one. I'll say one of them. I don't know that I would go so far as the single best, but honestly, you know, they're rather new to us. So we do have back data for them. We're talking about them. I should probably pull up a chart. This is the S&P 500. So here is your golden cross index, and here is the silver cross index. And you can see those crossovers are pretty good here to confirm before we get some of those rallies in the intermediate term using the silver cross. I suppose I should tell people what those mean since not everybody's seen them. Golden cross index basically tells you how many stocks within the index sector that you're looking at have a 50-day EMA above the 200-day EMA, or as we consider it, a bullish or bull market configuration for that index or for that sector. Um, and as you can see, Golden Cross is still falling here. And in this case, we did get that crossover, but it came a little bit too late uh, on that Golden Cross. But this is what we're looking for, these really oversold readings and the turn because yes, indeed, the Golden Cross did call the end of the uh, bear market back in 2020. Yeah, I, I'm not so sure that it's the best. I mean, certainly it gives you an idea of you know how old or oversold or overbought the market is. And uh, yeah, there we have the longer term. Guess we don't need that many years. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. Let's try. 
more like that's a bit better. But you can see we have the data going back to 2016. Um, but you know, you came up with this, uh, definitely credit where credit is due. And, you know, we were able to do that back data, but this, you know, it's, I wouldn't say a new uh, indicator for us, but certainly an interesting one that we've now started well, to watch, but you can see to me, here when they it bottomed. The, they are the best breadth indicators going. Yes. And that's, that's my claim. And, uh, I guess I should sit at a card table with a sign that says they are the breath the breath and the caters going. Change my mind. There you go. Change his mind. Um, study these uh, if you have the opportunity. These charts, as they are presented, are again only available to our subscribers, and they are updated daily. So again. I think that you know if you want a subscription, you can get one to either of our uh, publications. And in both cases, you will get to see all of these charts. They are available again to our subscribers to decisionpoint.com. Might as well slip a little bit of a uh, commercial in there. Yeah, right. Okay. Let us go. So we've looked at some of those sectors that are showing promise. And let me go back there so that we can. Were there any other questions that we should um, address? Uh, let's see. <clears throat> yes, there are a couple. Um, let me see right here. It looks, looks like this week the major techs or most of the fangs report. So maybe XLK will react more. Who knows? Yeah. Good point. Yeah, you know, and with earnings coming in, that's going to be shaking things up. You know, I think that most of them are probably going to come in pretty decent. I won't say great, um, but I imagine the majority are going to do uh, fairly well at this point. So we'll have to keep an eye out. This is our FANG Plus. Uh, and it's got pretty much, I think these are the top 10 capitalized stocks. Um, that's at that at one time, yes. I, yes. I, that's been a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you want I, to share your chart list? I know yours is probably more up to date. Um, well, here's a, another question: okay. uh, Does does technical analysis work on leveraged CEFs, closed in funds? Uh, PDI PDI is a symbol given. The answer would be. Technical analysis will work, but when you have a a leveraged fund, it's just it's much more uh, well, difficult volatile, yeah. to deal with. I mean, and uh, so you have to study how they, whatever you're working with, whatever security you've got to see how it reacts in the market and what indicators work best. Yep. But I think chart patterns, um, the PMO, stochastics, I think all of them are still useful for looking at these stocks, I mean, sorry, the ETFs. One thing that I talk about, uh, particularly with those, what we call juiced ETFs, uh, you need to be aware that they are two times, three times, whatever the index, stock now we've got single stock etfs uh, we have to be paying attention to that fact that they're twice three times more that's why they're called leveraged so one of the things that i often will say and i know uh, i believe i learned it from you uh, dad but that is you know if you're gonna go in and you had a position in mind if it were a single you know not leveraged basically take that amount of money that you were going to invest in it at that point cut it in half if you've got a two times and cut it into thirds if you've got a three times leveraged ETF. Just, you know, you have to manipulate your position size to, you know, you still have the hedge, but at least you're, you know, setting yourself up not for those big giant risk declines on those ETFs. You know, with, with stops, a leverage fund is going to, you're going to have to adjust them 
to be wider. Absolutely. Um, not being a trader, but that's obvious. Uh, that if you if you if you're using the same kind of stocks, you would uh, stops as you would with a uh, an unleveraged ETF or uh, a regular stock. Uh, it's very likely to get a hit because they're so volatile. So here's an example. This is the uh, bear semiconductor. It's three times the uh, lever. It's leveraged by three times. So again, that brings up a great point, Dad, and the fact that not only might you want to do those position sizes lower, you might need to double your stop. You might need to triple your stop or think of it in those terms because that's the kind of volatility that you are likely going to experience when you're in one of these leveraged ETFs. Just so on this stock, how about going from that the the, the October high and, and down to the current uh, level? And how far is that? That's 30%. 32% move. Yeah. I mean, so if you hadn't been in the leveraged, it would still be a 10% decline, but it would certainly be a lot less. Um, right. Yeah. So great question. All right. I'm going to go into our industry groups, but uh, thanks for monitoring that uh, Q&A box for us. I didn't uh, mention the chat box is for you. We don't pay attention to the chat box. If you do want to talk to everybody in there, I see there's only two messages right now, but just make sure that you click the drop down to send it to everybody. And Q&A, that's where we're going to get your symbol requests. All right, so I want to go into the industry summary. We talked primarily about consumer staples and industrials. So let's go ahead and we'll dive in a little bit more into those areas and see where the industries are that make the most sense. Uh, you can see that I use my industry group chart style here. If you wanna set up your own chart style for when you look at the industry groups on the summary, just set up the style you want to, to be displayed and then save that chart style as industry summary, industry space summary, and that will sh make your chart style show up on this page. Just wanted to get that through there. So what I'm gonna be looking for as we click through is what are the PMOs doing? What is the support levels going on? Are we seeing breakouts? Where is price located in terms of those EMAs. Stochastics, also an interesting thing to keep an uh, eye on as well. And then you'll see in this window, the relative strength to the S&P. So the first thing I would say when I look at this, no breakouts, drop below support. So personal products, certainly not looking that great. Looks like we may be seeing a PMO bottoming above the signal line, but we're not seeing any confirmation here from stochastics. Stochastics tend to be more sensitive than the PMO. So we always want to see the stochastics going in the same direction or the PMO going in the same direction. Sometimes stochastics are first, sometimes the PMO. Brewers, nice breakout here on brewers. Look at that acceleration on the PMO. Stochastics turning around. So this looks like a pretty strong industry group. Food retailers, wholesalers, again, another nice breakout. This one looks particularly interesting to me. I'm going to actually pull up the chart. You can see that we have that nice breakout, a move above the 50-day EMA, PMO giving us that buy signal in oversold territory, stochastics rising. You can see even relative strength is starting to pick up here. So I like this industry group quite a bit. Food products, uh, looking okay. I mean, everything's going well as far as the indicators here with stochastics and the PMO. Stuck beneath the 200-day, though, looking just not as um, uh, enthusiastic, I would say, as some of these others. This one, we've got a nice um, uh, move here on non-durable household goods, but I don't like the stochastics. They've tipped over. Drug retailers, this is an excellent, excellent look. Big breakout on Friday, and then we're getting some great follow through with a breakout above the 200 day EMA. The PMO is now in positive territory. 
stochastics at a nice uh, reading of 90 plus. And you can see relative strength has been trending up in this group for some time. So I like drug retailers. I, I like the food retailers, soft drinks looking good with a breakout as well. Stochastics tipping back up. Tobacco not looking quite as uh, bullish as some of the others. Distillers and vintners, no breakout quite yet. So not as excited about that particular industry group. And if we go into the industrials here, delivery services, uh, still kind of uh, puttering around there in a consolidation zone. Aaron, but for airlines, yes. Um, the hall monitor says it's time to get to symbol request. Oh, yes, the uh, parliamentarian. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll just click through these pretty quick here. So airlines looking good, aerospace, nice breakout, PMO moving upward. Don't like building materials. Defense, uh, something I brought up to my subscribers last week uh, with ITA, that particular ETF, I dropped that on subscribers Wednesday and uh, you can imagine it's doing quite well. Industrial suppliers, nothing looking interesting there. Little tiny breakout on machinery. Nice breakup here on commercial vehicles. Stochastic staying above 80. Heavy construction, not as exciting. Nice move, rounded bottom on diversified industrials. Really, a lot of these industry groups are showing a lot of strength. Not all of them, but you can see as we flip through this one here, waste disposal, new PMO buy signal. Railroads, not so much. Trucking, not so much. You can just see these consolidation zone. And transportation services, not so much. More of a consolidation so look for those groups, dive into those groups, find some stocks based on these industries that we've just looked at that are showing those strengths. So yes, let us go ahead and we will have 17 minutes for your symbol requests. ZBH. <laughs> All right, Zimmer, medical equipment company. So when we were looking at the industry groups, you could see what I'm looking for, breakouts. This is a big consolidation going on here. Certainly, if you're going with the trading range being between 104 and about 117, we're only we're not even halfway up that trading range. So if you're trading on the trading range, I mean, I think that there's still some upside potential here, but not enough for me. When you see the momentum flat, stochastics not doing well. Look at the industry group to the spy not looking good. It's not looking good against the SPY. It's a relative performer in its group. It performs pretty much in line, but that's why we're seeing this uh, move to the downside. I'm not liking this one. Okay. Uh, Home Depot, HD. Yep. All right. This one looks like it could be forming that double bottom on home improvement retailers. But I have to say, you know, we were looking at those sectors Consumer discretionary was not one of the sectors that was looking strong. And you can see this industry group is also failing here against the S&P. We do have a little bit of a uh, nice PMO whipsaw buy signal in play. But again, you know, we looked at those charts earlier and there were tons of breakouts available out there. This is not one of them. So as you know, it still looks pretty good. Your upside potential four, seven and three quarters up here. You know, your upside potential isn't that great when you, especially when you need to set a stop at about five and a half percent, maybe even six, six and a quarter. That's not the kind of upside potential risk reward that I'm looking for. Okay. I, INDI. Uh, question, is it a good long? Yeah, semiconductor. So, you know, certainly it's performing fairly well. We're getting the stochastics rising, which is something I like. Would like to have seen a positive divergence on the OBV. Certainly PMO is turning up. Stochastics <laughs> just went positive. Got the breakout above the 20 and the 50, rising trend holding. I'm just talking out loud here. We had a head and shoulders pattern. It didn't go down and fulfill the minimum downside target. So that's a good sign as well. 
I think this one looks pretty good. Um, not one of my favorite choices. Again, as I said, looking at those industry group charts, I know there are stocks that look just like their industry groups. And I think that we're going to find better choices there. But this one's certainly not bad. Okay. C-O-R-T. Concept Therapeutics in Pharmaceuticals. <clears throat> Pharma looking pretty good. You can see that it's been performing uh, relatively well to the SPY. Uh, this particular one performing in line with the SPY, which right now, since we're looking at a bull market type of move, I, I hate to even use bull market, bear market <laughs> rally in play. Since we do have that, you know, this could be a, a good place to be rising trend holding, but we are getting ready to hit that overhead resistance. And that's only about 4%, 4.5% away. If you had your stop set, I would be looking at about a 5 or 6% stop here, take you below these levels. I really want to see a breakout here to confirm what we're seeing on the indicators. But certainly if you hold have this, I would uh, certainly be continuing to hold it. But this isn't one I think I would race to enter. It's already made quite a bit of that move to the upside. Uh, STIP. Okay. Uh, tips, five years, zero to five year treasury bonds. All right, Dad, I'd, I'd love for your opinion on this one as well. I I mean, bonds in general, I know neither, you know, I ni neither of us are fans of bonds right now, um, but I do see flat top rising bottoms here, but I just know intuitively I'm really not expecting these bonds to do right. that. Right, I don't see any future in bonds. It may be some short-term moves that you could catch, but um, the thing about this is a bond fund essentially, and uh, bond funds. If you buy the bond itself, you are guaranteed a return, but in a bond fund, uh, they you're never really guaranteed anything. Right. And so no, I, I think that's... And this could be a too. reverse flag. Uh, your upside potential, I mean, I get it because, you know, you're not looking at huge amounts of risk. I mean, your stop would only be maybe 1%, but your upside is, potential till the next level of resistance... These are tips. About one and a quarter. These are tips. They're supposed to be... Uh, giving you a good deal in a, during inflation, then they they suck. Look at them. Nothing here. I'm right. at the weekly. I mean, certainly not as bad as something like TLT. Um, and you are getting those dividends, but the, those dividend percentages are nothing compared to you know, like you were saying, the guarantee you're supposed to get at the end of the period. We have a question here. What does a black candle designate on your charts? Ah, great one. Let's just go straight to the five month candle. So there are two bullet there. There's a bearish candlestick that we don't want to see. And then there's a bullish candlestick that we want to see just based on color. Filled black candlesticks, you do not want to see. Those are bearish, okay? And the reason they're bearish, yes, you closed higher for the day, but you closed in this case well below your open. So that tells you that the bears ultimately started to pull price down and you no longer were, you know, basically the bears were starting to take control by the end of the day. The hollow red candlestick is the opposite of a bearish black candles, filled black candlestick because that tells you that even though you closed lower on that prior day, you did close above the open. So in that case, you've got the bulls maybe starting to take control. So in this case, the filled black candlestick filled what it was supposed to fulfilled, which was a down day the next day. Didn't get that out of this hollow red candlestick uh, I do find the filled black candlesticks tend to perform better on, on their results. But remember, with candlesticks, these are one-day patterns. 
they're giving you insight into the next day. They're not giving you insight for much more than that. Yes, they can mark points of an, you know, an inflection point in the market, but ultimately that's what a filled black candlestick is. And I did have a question about that. So thank you for bringing that one up. Uh, Larry wants to know what the VIX is telling us. Ah, well, this is a great chart to have up for that as well. You know, it's telling us not so much in my opinion. Um, you can have a different opinion, Dad. But the fact that we're getting these Bollinger Bands squeezing so tightly, it's not telling us what we want to know, which is getting those punctures above and below. It's now really easy for the VIX to puncture those Bollinger Bands on our inverted scale. We do invert it. Um, it'll be easier for those punctures to occur, and then you're going to end up with not getting the signal that you want out of them because a downside puncture usually is going to tell you you're going to see that move to the upside, a, a, an inflection point that or a pivot point. If you get the break above those Bollinger Bands, that's going to tell you to look for downside movement. So mm -hmm. while they are squeezed, I don't think it's telling us too much. The readings themselves are still pretty high. Um, considering we're heading into this bear market rally. But at the same time, you know, sentiment, we want it to be very bearish going on the way up. Um, the squeeze is basically a sign of low volatility, and it's a precursor to high volatility. In this case, uh, I think we should expect the uh, VIX to move higher. On the inverted break out on the upside on our scale here. Yeah. So uh, and we've got it above the we do have it now above its moving average. And that right. does suggest uh internal strength. You can see back here it was above the moving average all the way from the low here to the top here. So right. we want to have it above that moving average, if nothing else. On our inverted scale. Okay. And is the rally in Yang just a rush for the exit that will quickly be reversed, or is it a trend that being continued? Wow. Um, full disclosure, I own this one. And, um, well, I'm a happy camper right now. <laughs> I had not looked at this chart um, this morning. Um, oh, I can you know, tell you about this. The, uh, the uh, Chinese... Uh, I think it was technology that I saw, but there they were down, you know, like 10, 15 percent, big whole bunch of them. So, yeah, they're the uh, the the fact that uh, it's the premier is no, I'm not there. It's a proper term, but it's going he's getting another four or five years and uh, he's he's uh, going to be slamming a lot of the. Uh, billionaire uh, peop, you know, Chinese over there. So yeah, uh, and I found this to be a really nice hedge. Honestly, um, this is my hedge I uh, have been using. I did uh, pull back this hedge a little bit and I'm kind of uh, regretting that right now. <laughs> <So well. laughs> but, uh, you know, I have my position, darn it. Um, but when, you know, when we're looking at a bull market, I was thinking it, it is a hedge. But ultimately, you know, I think that this is still going to be a pretty good place to be for all the reasons that you just explained, Dad. I think that, um, you know, the fact that we're rallying and yet this quote unquote hedge is really doing us uh, proud here. Um, this one that I presented to subscribers two, three weeks ago. Uh, so this one should be on all of their radars and I hope some of them popped in here. Uh, I did let everybody know I was buying it, but I always caution just because I'm buying it, don't rush in because I'm not a registered investment advisor and all trading decisions are your own. Okay, so is it a rush to, you know, we're gonna get a rush to the exits. I don't know about this, but I have to say, seeing this big gap up, I mean, this just begs to be a reverse island um, formation. It just begs for a, a gap back down. Um, 
you know, for me, I'm going to raise my stop level by quite a bit based on this. Whenever you get those parabolic moves, and this certainly is one. Good to today's have a- move is, is tri- strictly Chinese politics. So yes. it could collapse too. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, if the parabolics, and that's exactly what could happen here, is you will get that um, breakdown. It will be painful. It will be swift. So if you want to lock in some uh, some of that uh, profit there, and again, I'm just oh, killing, kicking myself right now. Um, but if you want to lock some of that in, uh, that, that would probably be good. I wanted to lock in some of my profit, and uh, well, there we are. So think about a trailing stop here. You know, when you get these parabolic moves, the trailing stops follow you up so that when you do get that big breakdown and it can happen just like it's happening here, but to the reverse side, you're at least covered um, and you'll be able to book some of that, you know, amazing gain you're going to get. So I'm seeing this and I'm, I'm probably going to go right to my account after this and uh, hit a trailing stop on it. Okay. Uh, What indicators would signal topping of energy-related stocks? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) So the indicators, again, we'll be watching this, uh, our sector charts. We're going to want to watch to see when we start losing participation here. You can see that when we start to lose that participation, when we start to see that downturn in it, that's when you start seeing the declines. So these are really important indicators. Look at the silver cross. I mean, the silver cross was just pretty much right on it when it had the negative crossover right here. So this would be something that I would say an indicator to watch silver cross index for the the intermediate to shorter term. Stochastics for the very short term, it's a great way to watch. Look at what happened here. They pretty much gave us the signal we needed right at that top. So those would be, in my opinion, some of those indicators you'd want to watch. Forget the PMO. And of course the PMO. (laughs) You can see that I know I I just assume everybody's uh, thinking the PMO. But yes, seeing it turning over as well. So those are the signs. Those are the indicators you're going to want to watch. When XLE starts to fail here, or even if you're just looking at your own industry group uh, ETF chart, um, just look for those particular ones. You can't get those indexes on a single stock. So you'll be wanting to see where it stands as far as the RSI, PMO, and stochastics. Okay. Um, Let's see. How about CORT? Okay, I we did see ORT. I do see oh, we did? Had it. I do see Linda had um, a question and anonymous. Uh, most, but not all ETFs lose money leverage. Why not just buy a short leverage ETF, especially in a bear market? Well, I uh, uh, yes, I mean, what that's one of the discussions. Do you just short the actual? ETF that you want to be short on, or do you get into um, a, actually a, an ETF going the other way? Ultimately, it's the leverage. Do you really want to have that leverage in a bear market? Maybe you do because you're trying to protect whatever you have on the long side. So leverage may make sense. But if you're just feeling negative about XLE, short XLE, you don't have to go find the ETF that does that. But I do want to thank all of you for being here. The Decision Point Trading Room replay airs at 3 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, on the Stock Charts TV channel as well. And with that, we will say goodbye and good luck and good trading.